Anesthesia. It's 1808 and you wake up one day and notice that years of lack of general hygiene and poor shoes have left your feet infested with jiggers and fungus that have eaten up your toes and are now threatening to move up to your leg. The course of action was pretty simple then. They have to amputate it. You wait for the surgeon to enter the room and calmly wait for the other doctors to give you anesthesia so you can wake up in a few hours in better shape. But then you remember it's 1808. At best, you'll be getting a bottle of vodka and a leather belt to bite on as the surgeon hacks away at your foot using a bone saw. This would change, however. In the 1840s, a young dentist in Boston named William Morton began experimenting with laughing gas and ether after a previous scientist, Humphrey Davy had used them as insensibility agents, things that make you numb. He tested ether on himself and a pet dog, rendering them unconscious yet unharmed. Convinced of its potential, Morton arranged surgery at Massachusetts General Hospital. On October 16, 1846, a milestone was reached. A patient was given ether vapor to inhale deeply. As the man lapsed into unconsciousness, a tumor was painlessly removed from his neck. When he awoke, he was alive and well and had no recollection of the procedure. Smallpox Vaccine A vaccine you don't even have for a disease eradicated in 1980 might not be the most groundbreaking medical advancement for everyone born after 1981. Still, you understand how big of a deal smallpox was before we could even control it. Smallpox killed between 300 to 500 million people in the 20th century alone, with smallpox being one of the biggest killers of Native American populations after Europeans arrived, with some estimates that it decimated populations by 90% or more in certain areas. Even if you did survive the agonizing symptoms, about two-thirds of survivors would be left with permanent scarring or blindness. The smallpox vaccine was invented in 1796 by the English physician Edward Jenner. Jenner's idea was to intentionally infect people with the much milder virus from cowpox blisters, which he noticed gave milkmaids immunity to smallpox. On May 14, 1796, Jenner took pus from a cowpox blister and inoculated an eight-year-old boy named James Phipps. Phipps developed mild symptoms but no serious illness. Later that year, Jenner exposed Phipps to the the smallpox virus, and the boy did not contract the disease, providing evidence of his breakthrough. Polio Vaccine You know a vaccine did its job when almost half of the population has no idea why they got it in the first place, and polio is no different. In the early 20th century, the virus was a massive endemic in the United States that could cause children to become disabled, cause paralysis and permanent disability, or put people in things called iron lungs, machines that helped disabled patients breathe. Polio could be spread through saliva, coughing, mucus, or even contaminated water. So you can imagine that everyone was scared out of their minds at its height. Then, in 1952, a researcher at the University of Pittsburgh named Jonas Salk did what many people thought was impossible. After years of experimentation on killed polio virus samples, he successfully created a vaccine that could safely build immunity. Soon afterward, a field trial was undertaken immunizing nearly 2 million U.S. children with what became known as the Salk vaccine. Perhaps the most exciting thing he did was refuse to patent it despite the fact that this would have made him the wealthiest man in the world at the time, as he believed everyone needed to get the vaccine. Germ theory. Before things like bacteria were discovered, the general idea of how people got sick was the idea of humor and miasma or just bad air. It went along the lines of breathing in the smell of rotten flesh and getting sick from the plague from it. If anyone suggested anything else, it would often be seen as heresy or just insanity, as with Ignaz Semmelweis's case. After he realized that surgeons who were operating on cadavers went straight ahead to help women give birth without washing hands and were causing a spike in infant children, he asked them to start using a cleaning solution before entering the labor room. At the time, all the doctors refused and ridiculed him for even thinking that. Around the same time, a French chemist named Louis Pasteur, through a series of studies, conceived the theory that tiny living organisms already present were responsible for fermentation and food spoiled, proving that Ignaz's theory was correct and many infections can be avoided simply by keeping up good hygiene. X-rays 
While experimenting with cathode ray tubes in his lab, physics professor Wilhelm Röntgen made an accidental observation. On November 8, 1895, Röntgen detected a fluorescent glow from a nearby chemically coated screen. It seemed the cathode rays were generating a never-before-seen type of ray that could pass through the cardboard covering the tube. When he placed his hand in the path of these mysterious X-rays, he was stunned to see an eerie shadowgram of his bones projected onto the plate. Röntgen's mind raced with possibilities. He quickly aimed the X-ray beam at objects like a book, a deck of cards, and even his wife's hand and ring. The ray's unique ability to penetrate and create images of the body's interior composition was amazing. For the first time, physicians could visualize organs, bones, bullets, and tumors inside living patients without surgery. Shattered limbs that had been impossible to examine and set properly could now be diagnosed. Though unknown to him at the time, he was basically dosing himself with lethal amounts of radiation that later went on to cause him to get cancer. Antiseptics For centuries, most of the world's hospitals had a reputation for making minor illnesses life-threatening. To give even more context, if a patient were to come with, say, a wound infected by a soldier, some monks from Oxford would dress the wounds with herbs and sometimes goat dung to induce pus because they thought this was a good sign. The hospitals were filthy and unclean. Doctors never washed their hands, and surgeons would reuse the same tools on different patients without ever bothering to clean them. Up to 50% of amputation patients perished from sepsis, where bacteria is introduced into the wound and causes widespread organ failure. In the 1800s, surgeon Joseph Lister in Glasgow, Scotland, confronted surgery's appallingly high death rates. Inspired by Louis Pasteur's germ theory, Lister used carbolic acid spray as an antiseptic in operating rooms to kill bacteria bacteria and demanded the tools be cleaned after every surgery. He also insisted on cleaning wounds the same way. DNA Sequencing The instructions for how living things are built and functioned for centuries remained a total mystery, like a book written in an unknown language. God had apparently hidden how he made things the way they are behind billions of proteins we couldn't read. But in the late 1900s, scientists finally cracked the code and learned to read those instructions through DNA sequencing. Just like how books contain words of letters in a certain order, DNA is made up of chemical letters, A, C, G, T, arranged in precise sequences that spell out the words of genes. DNA sequencing revealed how to translate those sequences letter by letter. It was like gaining the ability to take any book with no title or author and slowly spell out the entire thing word for word. You could finally read and understand what was written inside rather than just staring at scrambled letters. At first, reading DNA sequences was extremely difficult. It took years of hard work to spell out even tiny sections. DNA sequencing could make anything possible, including cancer cures, better crops, and even the secret to immortality. We could find these things hidden away by comparing our DNA with that of other animals. Organ Transplantation For a long time, when vital organs like the heart, lungs, or kidneys failed, it meant an unavoidable death sentence. The body parts are just too complex and too difficult to fix once damaged by things like cancer or excessive alcohol. However, with time, as medicine advanced, we could do more ambitious things like organ transplants. An organ transplant is like being able to remove a faulty engine or battery from an essential machine and swap in a new working one to get it running correctly again. Except in this case, the machine is the human body, and the swapped components are the heart, liver, lungs, and more. At first, the idea seemed unbelievably far-fetched and risky. How could you possibly put a living organism from one person into another and expect it to take over seamlessly? As you see, the body always views these organs as threats because it doesn't ever remember making them in the first place. So from its point of view, it might as well be a cancerous growth. So early transplant attempts went very poorly as patients' immune systems attacked and rejected the foreign organ. But over decades of research, doctors developed anti-rejection drugs and better surgical techniques. They learned how to transfer organs while keeping them safe. MRI 
Years after the discovery of x-rays, looking inside the human body was like navigating a maze while blindfolded, drunk, and walking backwards. X-rays did provide some guidance, but still left many areas obstructed from view. You could see a tumor in the skull, yes, but the exact area or location was still up for guessing by the surgeons. An MRI is like a highly sophisticated camera that can capture extremely detailed 3D pictures using powerful magnetic fields and radio waves instead of light. But rather than just showing the outside surface, it produces clear images that allow you to slice into the body's interior from multiple angles. It's almost like having the ability to strip away a house's walls, ceilings, and floors all at once to inspect the underlying framing, plumbing, electrical wiring, and all the hidden infrastructure while it's still fully constructed and working normally. Before MRIs, certain areas such as the brain, spinal cord, joints, and soft tissues remained fuzzy and obscured even with x-rays and early computed tomography CT scans because unlike bones, which are very solid and absorb x-rays, the brain is a soft mass, so it doesn't take up as much. However, by safely tuning magnetic fields, radiologists could now generate crystal clear cross-sectional images of these areas in multiple planes. Chemotherapy Almost always, cancer is usually a result of a bunch of cells in a given area that have a mutation that prevents them from dying and makes them just keep on multiplying without caring what will happen to the rest of the body. With chemotherapy, these drugs disrupt the rapid cell division that is a hallmark of cancer cells. Unlike normal cells in the body, which divide in an orderly, controlled fashion, cancer cells divide quickly and without as fast as possible, as soon as possible. There are hundreds of chemo drugs with hundreds of ways they kill cancers. Still, usually, the common ones work by damaging the genes or molecules that allow cancer cells to divide uncontrollably. By attacking cancer cancer cells at these critical stages of rapid division, chemotherapy can curb or control the growth and spread of tumors. The drugs circulate through the body to reach cancer cells that may have traveled from the original tumor site. Though, as you can predict, it's not without its side effects. Sometimes chemotherapy is like hammering in a doornail, but because you feel the hammer might miss, you drone strike the area for good measure just to make sure. Yeah, you hammer in the doornail, but you also destroy the door, and in this case, these are your other cells, like hair or skin, which gives chemogoers a ghostly look. Gene Therapy You are who you are because of specific genes that code your appearance, personality, or even what you like. In essence, you are in many ways a walking and talking genetic blueprint that has hopes, desires, and dreams. For many genetic diseases, the underlying cause was like a defective blueprint that cells followed to build an essential protein or enzyme. This flaw became copied endlessly, leading to disorders like cystic fibrosis, hemophilia, and some cancers. Conventional medicine could only treat the symptoms, not fix the root issue. Then, a new therapy arrived that could rewrite those wrong instructions. Gene therapy. Gene therapy is like going into the body's original architectural plans, finding the lines with errors that specify building something ineffective or dysfunctional, and editing them with the correct details instead. It's like catching a design flaw early before countless defective products get manufactured. Rather than providing treatments that help manage a genetic condition, gene therapy introduces functional genes into a patient's cells to compensate for the flawed, disease-causing version. It's like uploading a master correction file to override the existing code. Some gene therapies employ harmless viruses as biological delivery vehicles to smuggle the therapeutic genes into the targeted cells. Others use microscopic fat bubbles to carry the genetic cargo payloads across the cellular membranes. Once the corrected genes are inside, they produce functional proteins from the updated blueprint. This allows processes to be restored to their proper functionality. So this is good news for people who love Swift's music as there is still hope.